Welcome to News Wrap Local. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here. Happy Black History Month. After providing a few brief updates on this month's local stories, we'll speak with our guest, Assemblymember Chris Holden. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Briefs. Laurie Leshen has been appointed Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Vice President of Caltech. Leshen is an internationally recognized scientist whose career has spanned academia and senior positions at NASA, including two White House appointments. She joins JPL from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, one of the nation's oldest private STEM universities, where she has served as president since 2014. She is the first woman to become president in the university's 150-year history and will be JPL's first female director. Leshen has been lauded for her barrier-breaking leadership in the space industry and in academia, as well as for her accomplishments as a distinguished geochemist and space scientist. Upon her appointment, Leshen said, I am both thrilled and humbled to be appointed the director of JPL. In many ways, this feels like a homecoming. Some of the most impactful experiences of my career have taken place on the Caltech campus and at JPL. Leshen will formally assume her position on May 16. Assemblyman Chris Holden has taken over authorship of Assembly Bill 257 and announced several clarifying and substantive amendments to the measure to address stakeholder concerns. If passed, AB 257 would resolve issues in the fast food business by creating a fast food sector council that would promote industry-wide collaboration and focus efforts on improving worker protections and standard operating procedures. The council will conduct research and submit a report to the legislature outlining their recommendation and will include state agencies, employers, and worker representatives. The bill would enhance local, state, and federal laws and regulations instituted to require operational changes to protect employees from the COVID-19 pandemic. In a statement, Holden said, We have a chance to lift up small business owners and essential workers with AB257. And I look forward to working with franchisers, franchisees, employee representatives, and stakeholders to create an inclusive solution to move this bill through the legislature. The Pasadena Human Relations Commission will recommend the creation of a new policy aimed at stopping the spread of misinformation ahead of this year's upcoming election season. The commission started discussing potential recommendations to the city council to address misinformation after it was reported in December that flyers filled with anti-Semitic theories regarding COVID-19 were distributed in Pasadena. Commissioner Jonathan Horton suggested that the city council create a position or a task force within the public information office that would focus on countering false information. Commission Chair Brandon Lamar agreed that the spread of false information should be addressed. However, he also said there is a need for more research on the matter before the commission makes a recommendation to the city council. The commissioners have agreed to invite speakers who will help them in making recommendations to the council at an upcoming meeting. Heads up, Mayor Victor Gordo's State of the City Address will take place this Thursday, the 24th at 7 p.m. So mark your calendars. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, shortly after the resignation of independent police auditor Brian Maxey, Civilian Police Oversight Commissioner Patricia Kanaga has resigned from the newly established commission due to an unknown conflict of interest. Council member Steve Madison of District 6, who appointed Kanaga, will submit a nomination for her replacement, which will be considered for approval by the full city council. Also in police news, the shot spotter gunfire detection system has now been activated in an effort to combat the rise of gun violence in this city. Will it work? We'll find out, but something must be done because kids are being killed. The city council also approved additional spending on more automatic license plate readers. Two, the PCC faculty association and college administrators have reached an agreement to ensure safety on campus following weeks of negotiations and protests. Students and staff were required to, to return to campus late last month 
even though the Omicron variant was surging. The new protocols require students to have a negative test within 72 hours of showing up on campus and get tested once a week. Three, a new hearing in the U.S. National Women's Soccer Team's pay disparity lawsuit against the U.S. Soccer Federation is scheduled for March 7th. They originally filed their suit in March 2019, and in March 2020, a federal judge in Pasadena rejected the soccer player's claim that they receive less pay than the men's team. The women's team then appealed the decision, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has asked to address a three-judge panel in an attempt to reinstate their claim. Four, negotiations continue between Pasadena and Caltrans over the transfer of ownership of the 710 freeway stub from the state to the city following the cancellation of the 710 freeway tunnel project. City staff have conducted studies analyzing the feasibility of turning the land into a local street network and are now working on a relinquishment agreement. City staff provided updates to Metro's recent planning and programming committee meeting, Pasadena City Council meeting, and California Transportation Commission. One question that remains is, will the relinquishment of the 710 stub actually give Pasadena title to the land or just control of the roadbeds? Five, the nomination period for the June 7th primary election for City Council Districts 3, 5, and 7 is now open through March 11th. Nomination papers are available for candidates in the City Clerk's Office at City Hall, room S228. Two candidate workshops were also held this past week, and a number of candidates have already pulled nomination papers. An interesting factoid reported in Pasadena Now yesterday. No incumbent has lost a city council election since Bill Preparian upset Joe Heckman in 1987. Six, the Municipal Services Committee approved a Pasadena Water and Power Plan that could result in a 2.7% average annual rate increase in Pasadena customers' utility bill. Power Resource Planning Manager Robert Castro said it will result in an annual increase of 0.002 to 0.003 cents per kilowatt hour for all customers. The plan will now go to the full city council for a final vote. Two public outreach meetings will be held about the rate raise on March 1st at Victory Park Community Center at 6.30 p.m. and March 9th at Robinson Recreation Center at 2 p.m. Seven. The City Council approved a $32,800 contract to the firm Brown Creative Partners to conduct a national search for a permanent city manager to replace former city manager Steve Mermel and current interim city manager Cynthia Kurtz. The firm will also develop a strategy for community engagement, determine the recruitment plan and timeline, and begin creating an ideal candidate profile. Eight. A sign outside the Lemley Playhouse 7 Theater said they unfortunately had to sell the property during the pandemic, but that the theater continues to have a lease back agreement in place to operate at the site for the time being. The new owner's redevelopment plans currently under consideration by the city do not include a theater. So the city is helping the theater owners find a new location in Pasadena. Nine. The PUSD Board of Education voted to approve the Redistricting Commission's new map that defines the boundaries of each district in the next 10 years. Board member and former board president Kim Kenny, one of two board members who voted against the motion to approve the map, said there was not enough time or community input. And 10. The city is gearing up to implement a social equity program for retail cannabis in the next few months. A new cannabis business incubator has been established to provide funding to applicants. Social equity programs are designed to ensure that those who bore the brunt of the war on drugs are able to equitably share in the benefits of the burgeoning legal cannabis industry. Let's patch in our guest, Assembly Member Chris Holden. Uh, Mr. Holden, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Assembly Member Holden was elected to the State Assembly in 2012. Before that, he served for almost 24 years as a Pasadena City Council member and mayor. He was the youngest council member at age 28. In addition to chairing the Assembly's Appropriations Committee, he also sits on the Communications and Conveyance, Environmental Safety and Toxic Materials, and Judiciary Committees. He was the Assembly Majority Floor Leader from 2014 to 2016, 
and the chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus from 2016 to 2018. So Assemblyman, uh, you've just been appointed as chair of the Appropriations Committee. What does that role entail? What, what are your priorities in this role? And, and how will that help elevate Pasadena as a state leader uh, in, in uh, state politics? Well, thank you. And again, uh, appreciate you inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Uh, first of all, um, uh, another important committee that I served on and chaired for five years was utility and energy. So we had an opportunity to deal with just about every major project that dealt, or proposal that dealt with energy and um, climate change, uh, carbon emissions and goals that the, the state had uh, put their arms around. So we're very proud of that uh, work. Uh, SB 100 was one of the bills that we were able to move forward on. Um, but in the role of appropriations chair, you're sort of in a uh, place of uh, kind of being the traffic cop, if you will, on uh, policies that may have a fiscal impact uh, that exceed what uh, the budget uh, can manage. Uh, and, and so you're in a position of looking at good policy. The whole goal is to make sure that good policy moves, um, a policy that has uh, fiscal uh, limitations that you try to work with authors uh, to make sure that you can get it down uh, to a place where it's more acceptable uh, and, a, and, a, and achievable uh, within the contours of the budget. Uh, it's always a very difficult uh, process of being on the outside looking in over the years and uh, seeing how challenging it could be uh, and not really always knowing uh, why all bills uh, move or don't move uh, so I'm in a position where I have an opportunity to engage with every member in the legislature, not only in the assembly, but also in the Senate. Uh, we have a great working relationship with um, the, the folks over in the Senate and I think also and clearly within my house. So my goal is to make sure that I, I work with members, uh, give them an opportunity to um, keep their bills alive as best they can. Uh, and try to, with my staff and their expertise, help uh, get them to a place where bills will move rather than not. Uh, that's our goal. The impact as it makes to Pasadena, um, you know, we're, I, I've been very successful over the years in moving legislation that has been targeted for Pasadena um, or directly or indirectly. And, and so I think that, you know, representing the area um, understanding the uh, the desires and, and goals of the people who have elected me. Uh, I've supported bills that not just my own that are strong and, uh, and positive and effective to deal with um, reforms, uh, policing reform, um, uh, deal with issue of transportation, um, uh, social justice, education, uh, ensuring bills like mine that uh, promote dual enrollment uh, and address the needs and have and actually came out of conversations with people in the district. Uh, so I've, I think that in terms of what I've been able to do, the kinds of bills that I support uh, that line up with the values of the people in the communities that I represent, uh, will continue to do that, whether I'm the author or not. And, and I think that that's how we can continue to move an agenda, uh, whether it's environmental uh, awareness and the things that we need to do and bills like um, ensuring that we're taking lead out of drinking water, which I've authored a number of bills in that space and others have as well. I, I just think that Pasadena is um, in the San Gabriel Valley. It's not just Pasadena, but it's mm -hmm. all the other important communities that I represent in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, we just keep listening. Uh, we take input uh, from uh, the people in the community, whether they call in or send in their notes. And so uh, my door is always open and we try to be res responsive. And, and because of the activists that live in my district and that are very engaged in public policy, we hear about their thinking on a lot of a number of issues. So uh, we, we try to make sure we carry that to the forefront of the decision making. And, and what are some of the, the major bills you're working on right now? Um, well, we've got a number of bills that are in the social justice, social justice uh, reform space. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, it's come to our attention and we understand the 
impact that solitary confinement has on individuals who are incarcerated, um, how it is not in any way uh, conducive with you know, uh, rehabilitation, uh, that it actually created, creates greater harm uh, to the individual. And so we have a bill that's designed to, uh, to sort of do away or modify or change that policy around uh, the use of solitary confinement. Um, interrogation of a minor. Uh, we've seen in other states how there's been legislation that has emerged and many of us thought that in terms of interrogating a minor that, that was some, there was some kind of law already on the book to, to limit or control that. And so here in California, we are pursuing that type of legislation through the bills that we're putting forth this year uh, to ensure that minors' rights are, are protected, uh, that law enforcement in doing its job and the things that they have to do is we understand what those issues are and we're trying to make sure that the bill is respective of those kinds of concerns that they may that they're bringing to the forefront but generally i think most people recognize that uh, interrogating a minor without having uh, a parent or a guardian or uh, someone of legal standing uh, with them is problematic uh, dual enrollment uh, we've uh, been putting forth legislation since uh, 2015 uh, to address increasing opportunities for students to take college level courses while in high school, giving them the opportunity to start college at, and only have two years uh, to, uh, to put forth as opposed to four. So it creates affordability issues. Uh, it also uh, gives them an opportunity for many who never thought they have a chance to go to college to get their arms around and see that they can do the coursework. So expanding dual enrollment to, to DACA students with various bills that we've done to do that. And this bill uh, that we have that we're moving forward this year uh, for court uh, school students, uh, those in the foster care system or in the court system, <clears throat> will have the opportunity to compete uh, with and participate in the dual enrollment program as well. So kind of an idea of some of the things that, uh, that we're working on, as well as continuing to put a lot of energy and effort behind getting funding uh, to complete the gold line uh, to the city of Claremont and Montclair. Uh, that's a major priority for us and working with my colleagues in the legislature, uh, we're, we're very hopeful that we'll be successful in that regard. Right. And uh, affordable housing, of course, remains a major issue in, in California. But where, where do you stand on legislation such as SB9? For example, should there be exemptions or carve-outs for cities like Pasadena who, who say they include more affordable housing provisions than, than maybe some other cities and feel like subdividing properties uh, will damage single family neighborhoods. What's that sweet spot uh, in the back and forth between cities like Pasadena and the state over these housing laws? Right, well, I, I, I like to think that SB9 is the sweet spot. Uh, it's a modest step uh, to, to try to address a major issue. Um, we've seen proposals in the past, um, SB 50, that was authored several years ago, which in my view and many others would have devastated single family neighborhoods. So that kind of a proposal, even though it may work for certain Bay Area communities, would have had a, a, a disastrous impact on the quality of, uh, of single family neighborhoods in cities like Pasadena. Um, SB 9 creates a carve out for historic districts, uh, and certainly Pasadena in many respects is a historic city. Mm -hmm. uh, not too many communities or neighborhoods that are left after you start looking at the, uh, the historic communities that we've already identified. Um, but I do think that it, again, is a modest step because if we don't do anything, I mean, everybody recognizes the need for affordable housing, but at every turn, if we say no to every proposal, then we're not making any progress uh, to, to move the needle. And I will admit that Pasadena has done more than its share. Uh, I shouldn't say more than its share, but it has certainly exceeded what other communities have done in terms of trying to, to tackle the issue over the years and have actually made some great success. But when the problem is as large as it is, it's, it takes a lot of effort to, uh, on all levels, not just the state, but local levels, uh, initiating their own ordinances and proposals to, um, to tackle affordable housing. Mm -hmm. crisis. Right. And and so tell me about um, AB 
1737, the, the Camp Safety Bill, a, a Pasadena child, Roxy Forbes, of course, tragically drowned at a nearby camp, uh, which highlighted the need for more regulation of these camps. So what does this legislation do? Well, this is this issue was brought to us by the Forbes family. And, and quite frankly, it was such a tragedy that but they challenge your, their grief into action. And I, and I salute them. And they're just wonderful parents, people uh, who love their daughter and now want to make sure other children are safe, that they're not, when they're left at these day camps, uh, that they know that they will be alive when they go back to pick them up. And whether it's uh, oversight and making sure that there are certain things that are done to make sure that these camps are better regulated uh, that they are, um, that the people who are working there uh, have a clear defined responsibilities and, and that, uh, that there is a, a high degree of emphasis placed on safety for the child uh, at these particular camps. And, and so we're very hopeful that with the kinds of changes that we're going to be looking to make through this legislation, it will create a benchmark for how um, we we'll raise the standards uh, uh, for the camps in a way that, that will put them in a stronger position, uh, and a more thoughtful place to be to make sure that kids are safe, uh, the camp counselors who have access to these children are, are uh, regulated in a way that they know backgrounds, they know uh, information that will be very clear to them uh, that uh, they are up to the job of being able to uh, provide safety for, for these young kids on a 24 hour basis while they're in their care. And so a uh, big thank you to the Forbes family for continuing to keep this issue alive. And we're looking forward to having great success with this legislation this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, fingers crossed, uh, you know, we're entering the recovery phase of the pandemic. Uh, small businesses everywhere, including Pasadena, uh, are struggling to remain, remain viable following the, the economic disruptions. What role can and should the, the state play in, in helping these small businesses and cities like Pasadena and institutions like the Rose Bowl Stadium get back to some semblance of normalcy and vi viability? Right, I, I thank you for that. I think it's clear that the pandemic um, did some real, uh, some real harm to our economy. Uh, you know, in so many different ways, it created maybe opportunities for us to see how we can do life differently um, and certainly telecommuting has become sort of a new approach uh, that most of the companies weren't necessarily prepared to take advantage of before that are now and, and even within the capital we see that there's high demand for a desire to see that there remains some form of telecommuting um, but in terms of what it did in terms of keeping people uh, out of uh, venues like the Rose Bowl and events that went away because uh, bringing people together of large groups was not uh, advised uh, during the pandemic. And so when you have a, uh, and or being able to go out to restaurants and to, to be able to utilize uh, places that are commonly, you know, where we all gather, uh, certainly we put a lot of emphasis behind grocery stores and making sure grocery store workers were protected because that's where everyone definitely had to make their way. Um, we put resources behind small businesses, providing loans for federal dollars that would be available uh, to help keep them above flow, above flow. And then we also know that with the Rose Bowl, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resource that now has to compete in a, in a very crowded market between the Coliseum and the new stadium, SoFi and Inglewood. Even if there were no pandemic, that is going to create pressure points. Mm -hmm. but. We continue to work closely with the city of Pasadena where the state can uh, be a partner. We will continue to be a partner. And, and finally, what's, uh, what's next for you in your career? Are, are you looking at state Senate, state leadership, Congress? What, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, I, I'm into my next and, and my last term uh, in, in the legislature. And quite frankly, I spent all my 12 years that I'm eligible for in one house in the, in the assembly. Uh, so I'm not eligible to run for, for Senate. Uh, I love public service. I've been doing it since I was 24. Uh, and, I, and I enjoy making it work. I, I don't like systems that are dysfunctional that kind of keep and restrict resources and opportunities to, to get out to the fullness of, of our community and the people, especially those who are from disadvantaged communities. 
Um, so I, I enjoy it. Uh, we'll take it one step at a time. Right now, re-election that would go from 22 to 24. I term in 24, and then we'll see what's available and how the how the voters of uh, the communities I represent wish to promote me beyond that. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, well, thank you so much for for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about your work in the assembly. My pleasure. Look forward to coming back. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1888 when South Pasadenans voted to incorporate as a city, making it the sixth municipality in LA County. Before that, the area was part of the San Gabriel Orange Grove Association. Stockholders of that group voted to name their town Pasadena in 1875. Those living in the Southern area of the Indiana colony considered themselves South Pasadenans. At the time of incorporation, South Pasadena had a population of just over 500 people and its boundaries are about the same as they are today. According to the city's website, South Pasadena's Raymond Hotel and Costin Ostrich Farm went a long way toward attracting tourists and new residents to the Pasadena area in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of News Wrap Local. Tune in every third Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Sign up for my monthly email newsletter to get updates on my work by visiting justinchapman.substack.com. See you next month.